Hi everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, Art Atrium today. And it's great that the rain kept away. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging. We have two solo exhibitions at the same time today. The first one is William Young, who's been um, who's, <laughs> yeah, happy taking photos as he always does. You know, that's, uh, that's his life. And um, so he's got this series of work called Claiming Heritage. So uh, you obviously would have seen lots of William's works over the years, um, but he decided to have a dialogue with my work today and this series of work um, about his Chinese heritage. So from the beginning, on that side, all the way through, when he comes to Sydney from North Queensland, and then, um, and then the other series of work about China. So to open the show, we have um, Sandy Edwards, who is obviously... Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so Sandy, obviously, herself is a fantastic artist and photographer, um, but she's also a mentor to a lot of um, young emerging photographers, and she's a curator of lots of um, exhibitions. So, um, without further ado, I'd like you all to welcome Sandy Edwards. Sorry guys, I have to read this on computer because I didn't have time to go and print this out. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, I'll just get balanced. It has been my privilege to have lived in the same era as William Yang has for photography in Sydney. A lot has happened in this time, not the least of which is a shift to digital everything. As Moshe Rosenweg said to me, it is a steep learning curve. Well, for William and I, we had a foot in both camps, and part of William's brilliance is the simplicity of his solutions in regards to form and content. William is a storyteller, and he said in 1996, in the past, because of the way I was brought up, I did not value my own story. Well, he has certainly made up for that, in an extraordinary way since his early days of completing a BA in architecture and becoming involved in theatre in Brisbane, and to the emergence of his genius simplification of the photographic slideshow. William has been a major influence on me in many subtle ways. He has been part of my life and of the Sydney photographic community right through my own development as a photographer into curating and mentoring. And then there was my constant craving to understand my own story. There was William doing it. Over the years, I have come to the conclusion that we must all tell our story before we die, because no one else can do it for us. William has made a profession of telling his story, or I should say stories. I first met William at openings in the 70s, in a little gallery above the bookshop near Taylor Square in Oxford Street. He was always there taking photos of people attending the openings. The social hoi polloi of the time. I suppose he would have been called a paparazzi at that time. His first exhibition of photography was at the Australian Centre for Photography in its first building on the corner of Paddington and Elizabeth Streets. I remember the invitation card being a black and white portrait of sisters Sue and Joy Smithers. The exhibition was called Sydney Files. It was 1977. The exhibition radically changed William's visibility as an artist and as a person of interest. He had come out. <laughs> and I'm not talking about gayness, I'm talking about as a person of interest. <laughs> um, 
After that exhibition, I would sometimes choose, choose to turn my back on William at an opening, exercising my right of privacy. I had to be in the mood. However, years later, when he had his huge survey exhibition at the State Library of New South Wales, that was Diaries, in 1998, like many others, I found myself keenly searching to see myself represented in the, in the large <laughs> image selection. <laughs> I was happy to find myself in a photo with Grant Mudford. To be seen by William's camera was to exist. However, years later when he had his huge survey exhibition at the State Library of New South Wales, uh, I'm sorry, I started the wrong paragraph again, sorry, no, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I remember a friend of William's telling me that after he saw a slideshow of his food photos, at the MCA, maybe it was the fabulous trifle, 1995, that William had decided to go for it as an artist. These words had a major effect on me. I have thought about it for years later. So you have to decide to be an artist. When William spoke, you listened. He had a manner of hesitating before speaking. And as a shy person, that made me nervous. I felt I had to fill the gap. What William said seemed to be important, significant. I wanted to impress him. Over time, he was drawn out, he has drawn out the overview of his life story and shared that with us in a frank and open way. He has drawn on different forms to do this. Storytelling is at the heart of his practice. We all have a story to tell, but we may not know or feel confident to do it or we cannot see the feelings and the universality of what happens to us, or how to make our story enjoyable to others. I can listen riveted to William's slideshows and stage plays, yet I cannot make sense of my own life experiences, even though I have been documenting my friends and family in a very similar way to William. Perhaps I don't have the clarity and confidence that my stories are of value. William's experience of theater which he was engaging with in Brisbane in his, early in his life, seems crucial to the, in the evolution of his work into a kind of performance theater, which employed his personal observational stories teamed with photographic slideshows. Like William, I was always interested in photographs as part of a narrative, not just as single images. The slideshow is a very simple way of storytelling, more low tech than a film, and much easier to create. Add William's presence and his distinctive way of speaking and his dry humour and we have a very effective manner of telling a yarn. Not just any kind of narrative, a kind of truth telling drawn from life. A lot of the art of photography has been attached to the idea of the single image, a kind of distillation, a kind of masterpiece, like a painting yet not the same. Whereas cinema is expressed through a strip of images which together create movement and a sense of time. This is where William comes in. And by talk, talking to the images, he brings the story alive. Around us we see an exhibition drawn from William's life story. My favorites, my absolute favorites are his, his mother and his father at this end. It's a kind of haiku for the broader story that he's telling. Now with the advent of the moving image of that invention called the mobile phone, we can all create an ongoing narrative of our lives. Well, William is a million steps ahead of us and shows us we do not need the sophistication of technology to tell a story. The rest of us are just catching up. William makes us understand that photography is not just an objective record of the world we see in front of us, nor is it the artistic statement of an item of beauty or a record of architecture or nature beautifully composed, maybe in black and white. We put ourselves into our photographs without necessarily being aware of it. William has always put himself into his images in another way, by literally writing within the image, on the print, putting his thoughts, his story, the title, the name of the person he's photographing, and the emotional nature of his relationship to them. It makes the image personal without question, 
as the artist's hand is on the print. Just think of the number of images you see where the subject of the photo is either not named or named with the first name only, especially images of women by infatuated men. <laughs> I've seen a lot of them, that's all. <laughs> a painter signs a painting, a photographer usually signs outside the image, not within it. William, like Max Pam, who wrote around the outside of the frame, was fearless about writing onto the print, putting his thoughts and feelings out there for us all to see and identify with. William's greatest achievement is his commitment to community. His work is motivated by a desire to record, document, and celebrate the gay community, to make it visible. Not only that, to express pride and humanity in the Chinese presence in this culture of white Australia. He was slow to comprehend that he was a member of a minority and a not well accepted Asian culture in a very narrow-minded Australia of the 50s and 60s. To be a gay Asian man would not have been easy and yet he has succeeded in making that cultural experience familiar and with an empathetic heart. And whether he is showing us the painful truth about the impact of AIDS in Ellen's story, or simply reveling in the height of the pride parties, he has unflinchingly and tirelessly recorded his gay Chinese experience in Sydney in a way that no one else has done. The narratives about his mother touch me deeply his endless energy and responsibility for recording every event in Sydney circles is astounding. And even though he told me years ago, you take less photos as you get older, well, I do not see much evidence of that. <laughs> if you look on Facebook regularly, you can see that his commitment to faithfully representing his community and friends has not waned to this day. It is like a full-time job, one he should have been paid a salary for. I guess being seen and heard is a way of feeling engaged and informed, placing yourself at the centre of things. It was such a pleasure for me to be able, at the beginning of COVID, to attend his exhibition, Seeing and Being Seen at the Queensland Art Gallery, Quagoma, in 2021. May there be many more, and as I said up front, I feel extremely blessed and privileged to have had William Yang in my life. This is just a postscript. The show is called The Diasporic Dialogues. Feeling vague, I looked up the meaning of the word diasporic. The dictionary said, of, being, or relating to any group that has been dispersed outside its traditional homeland, either involuntarily or by migration. Well, I hope you feel fully embraced by all of us here. And that's to William, this is to William, where's William? Well, I hope you feel fully embraced by all of us here and much more broadly as being a major contributor to the history of this rich multicultural place called Australia. Thank you, Sandy. That's a very insightful speech. Um, we're going to have the star of the show, William, to um, say a few words to us. William. Thank you, Sandy, for that um, thoughtful and revealing um, summary of my life. <laughs> And, um, and also, I, well, while I'm thanking people, I should thank Mai, my uh, collaborator here, who actually, his, his idea for this exhibition ca came from her, and also the title, Diasporic Dialogues. And Simon for um, um, having us. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and thank you, Adam. For uh, in advance for the for the talk um, of my about mine, and um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my outfit. <laughs> uh, I just found out today from Fan that um, 
I'm wearing the costume, is, the coat is from uh, Beijing, where, where I did buy it, and he called it, it's a, a, a landlord's outfit, because it, it was expensive. <laughs> I got it at a sale and it was still very expensive. And it doesn't quite go with my festive hat, um, but I wore it anyway because there's a diasporic um, anecdote with this hat, which I sometimes wore to Simon's Chinese New Year dinners uh, about seven years ago, uh, which he used to have. And I wore it to one of them and um, there were the artists there, quite well-known artists, Shen Jiwei and Bo Jian, and they kept snatching the hat off my head and wearing it. And I was a bit um, uh, astonished. And, sudden, and then they told me that when they were growing up in China, that uh, they weren't allowed, these hats were banned. And so, um, they, um, so, so they wanted to wear one. That, that's the story. Yeah. Um, and also, I'd like to um, recite a story, which I recited all my speeches, and John MacDonald um, called it, wrote in it in a review that I've done this so many times that it's become an incantation. <laughs> so it's also my, it's my welcome to my country. When I was about six years old, one of the kids at school called me Ching Chong Chinaman, born in a jar, christened in a teapot, ha ha ha. I had no idea what he was talking about although I knew from his expression he was being horrible to me. So I went home to my mother, mother and I said, Mom, I'm not Chinese, am I? And my mother looked at me very sternly and she said, Yes, you are. Her tone was hard and it shocked me. And I knew in that moment that being Chinese was like a terrible curse and I could not rely on my mother for help or my brother who was four years older than me, very much more experienced in the world, he chimed in, and you'd better get used to it. So, um, now, I seem to, now I seem to have made a career out of being Chinese. <laughs> This is from the catalogue. I was brought up as an assimilated Chinese Australian, partly because of the way my mother brought me up. She had wanted my siblings and I to be more Australian than the Australians. But it was cultural as well. Migrants or new Australians, as they were called, were expected to assimilate and to speak English. Now, when I re read this back, I didn't kind of identify with New Australians because they were mainly applied to European New, new Australians. So that's a whole thesis of just about not identifying with being a New Australian because we were actually Chinese and looked different. And I knew from I was gay from a very early age and I came out as a gay man in the early 70s. During that exciting time of change, the gay liberation movement. It politicised me as I had to take on all the baggage of public opinion, which had a very negative view of homosexuality. Strangely, I never quite realised I was Chinese until my mid-30s. I identified as being Australian and I was in a state of denial about my Chinese heritage. In the 80s, I learned Taoism, a Chinese philosophy, and this led me to embrace my Chinese heritage, with hitherto, which hitherto had been unacknowledged. Now I see this as a liberation from racial suppression, and I prefer to say I came out as a Chinese. The last step in claiming my heritage was a trip to China in 1989. I was able to 
embraced China, and the Chinese I met welcomed me back, welcomed me back home. But the complexities of being bicultural became apparent. I've been back to China many times. Now I call myself mainly Australian and claim my Chinese heritage as part of my identity. This exhibition is about my journey to make that claim. Thank you. Thanks, William. If you enjoy William's work, and if you like to have it in your home, you should come and see me. <laughs> All the works are in addition, so don't be scared off by any red dots on it. You know, they are more available. Um, we're going to open my exhibition on the other side. So uh, if you bear with us for one minute, and then we'll, we start again with the second solo exhibition. Thank you.